Thank you, Amanda. On behalf of the Cape Cod Tufts Club, I want to welcome 99 participants to today's program. In addition to members of the Tufts community from around the country, we have many members from the intercollegiate alumni clubs of Cape Cod, including alumni from local schools such as MIT and Harvard. Through your generosity when registering for this event, we have been able to raise $225 for the Cape Cod Tufts Club Scholarship Fund. This fund allows us to award three $2,500 scholarships per year to deserving currently enrolled Tufts students from the Cape, Islands and South Coast areas. A few housekeeping items before we start the program. This meeting will be recorded and uploaded to our Tufts alumni YouTube channel and the Cape Cod Tufts Club's website. Closed captioning is automatically turned on. If you would like to turn this feature off, click live transcript at the bottom of your screen and hit hide subtitles. Here you also have the option to view full transcript if you'd prefer. You will notice your audio and video are disabled. Once we begin, you will see the presenter on your screen. You will be able to hear him, but he will not be able to hear or see you. You may need to adjust your volume. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, you can do so by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. This will open a window where you can type your questions. After the presentation, Amanda will read the questions for our speaker to answer. Now I'm going to pass the video off to Dr. Jack Whitehead, a member of our board who will introduce today's speaker. Jack. Thank you, Mike. Professor Pedlowski first became interested in ocean and atmospheric dynamics when he was a graduate student at MIT, and he attended a summer program in 1960 in Woods Hole here on the Cape. I first heard him speak when he was a rising star in about 1966, and by the mid-1970s, after teaching at MIT and joining the faculty at the University of Chicago, he was a firmly established star. In 1976, he was a Guggenheim Fellow at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And in 1979, we felt ourselves lucky to attract him to become the first, the Doherty Professor in the Physical Oceanography Department. He has numerous scientific accomplishments and he has always been dedicated to teaching that he has done extensively in the Woods Hole MIT Joint Program. And he's mentored many, many students and postdocs who are now leaders in the field. His three books are used throughout the world and I believe translated to some other languages. His honors are extensive, having received the Sverdrup Gold Medal from the American Meteorological Society, the Ewing Award from the American Geophysical Union, and he's a fellow in numerous professional societies and is a member of both the National Academy of Science and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Joe is well known throughout the worldwide geophysical fluid dynamics, we call it the GFD community, as well as the oceanography community. And many people from the GFD community are attending this lecture today. He regularly still attends that very summer program that began his interests. And he sits in the front row. So I'll turn it over to Joe. Thank you, Jack. Let's see if I can share my screen now. Yeah, there we are. Okay, I want to talk today about the ocean and its motion, the ocean in motion. The ocean is never at rest, and it's. I hope to persuade you and excite you about how beautiful and interesting its motion actually is, and talk a little bit about the physical understanding of that motion. Before I... Uh, get into the details, I first want to uh, uh, ask you to use your imagination. Let's imagine that you have been given a beautiful, a beautiful 10 room, 10 room house. Let's see, something is happening here. Um, not advancing. 
Uh, okay, there it is. There is the there is the uh, the house. Ten rooms. But you find out when you take occupancy that you can only live in three of those rooms. The other seven rooms are filled with a substance that you can't breathe. And in order to get to the three rooms you can live in, you have to go through those seven rooms somehow. That would be a, a, a funny business to be in, funny situation to be in. But that is exactly the situation that we're in, in our home, which is the Earth. Here is a nice picture from space of the Earth looking at the Pacific Ocean. Uh, here is one of the rooms that we can live in. You may recognize this room. Three-tenths of the Earth's surface is land that we can feel comfortable on, but 70% is covered by water. And uh, we have a hard time uh, going very far in that without a good deal of help. The water is, is uh, the oceans are so extensive that many people say that the earth should not be called the earth. The planet should be called the ocean. But uh, we use the ocean. We use it for uh, sustenance. We get food from it. We navigate it. We use it for trade. And it is a crucial player in determining the climate of the world. I'm going to talk about the circulation of the ocean. So the ocean is moving, but I'm not talking about the sloshing back and forth due to the tides or the wind waves breaking on the beach. I'm talking about the circulation, the general circulation, in the same way we would talk about the circulation of the blood in the body. And that circulation, here's a, one representation of the circulation, which shows the surface pressure distribution due to that motion, some arrows indicating the motion. And the point I want to make is, is here in the Pacific, the circulation is on a very large scale. It's planetary in size. It's not just little currents going this way and that way, but there's an organized circulation over a very large scale. Schematically, and this is a little bit misleading, but in each of the oceans, there, there are large gyres. It's in the Northern Hemisphere, they're, they're clockwise, counterclockwise in the Southern Hemisphere. You see them in both the Pacific and the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and there is a current going all the way around the Earth in the Southern Ocean around the circumpolar current. Here's another representation of it. Let's take a look here at the Atlantic just offshore of Cape Cod. And here is the subtropical gyre that rotating circulation uh, in mid latitudes, a big sweeping motion coming around southward and then returning on the Western side of the ocean in a very narrow current that we call the Gulf Stream. And the same thing happens in the Pacific Ocean it happens in the South Pacific Ocean. It happens in the South Atlantic Ocean. And the question is what drives this motion? How big is it? Why does it have the structure that it has? Here's another view of that circulation. And notice again, all the strong currents in this ocean are on the Western sides of the ocean. There is a real asymmetry between east and west. And there's nothing in the wind field that's forcing it that produces that asymmetry between east and west. And so this is one of the major puzzles that was presented to us uh, as oceanographers. How do you understand that fact? Again, here is another picture of that circulation. Here is that large gyre in the North Pacific and its boundary current on the Western side. In the Pacific, it's called the Kuroshio. In the Atlantic, we call it the Gulf Stream. There's the Brazil current in the South Atlantic and so forth. Why? These Western boundary currents 
are massive. The mass flowing past Cape Hatteras and the Gulf Stream every second is about 100 million cubic meters of water a second. If you use Gray's anatomy and say the average man's, average man's weight is 70 kilograms, this is something like more than the population of China rushing past Cape Hatteras every second. Just try to think about that. Everybody in China past Cape Hatteras every second, and that's what the water is doing. And, uh, and the similar flux of mass is occurring in the Kuroshio current in the Pacific. And this raises lots of questions. Why is that circulation of the gyre so asymmetric between east and west? What determines the fluid flux and the speed? And th these are very important issues for navigation, for biology of the ocean. How could we even think about going about answering them? So a little bit of physics, okay? Now, nobody is gonna get hurt here. This is just a little bit of, little bit of mathematics. Imagine we're on a rotating earth and we are once a day. And suppose on that rotating earth, we have a velocity represented by this arrow V. And suppose it's, as far as we're concerned on this rotating earth, this arrow is the same length and it's always pointing in the same direction. So it's just a constant speed, no acceleration. But if we step off the earth and we look at it from space, we know that the earth is rotating. So this velocity vector is rotating and the next instant it has moved up to here. And there's a little change in the velocity, a very small change every second as it rotates around. That's an acceleration. A change in the velocity is an acceleration. And notice that because of the rotation, it's at right angles to the velocity. Well, there must be, according to Newton's law, <clears throat> there must be a force in the direction of the acceleration to produce that acceleration. And this red arrow is that force. And so you have this constant flow, it appears to us on this, on this uh, where we're rotating around with the earth, but it's really an accelerating flow and requires a force perpendicular to the direction of the motion to keep that motion steady and in one direction. Now that acceleration is omega times V that gives us that swinging of that velocity vector. It's actually two omega V. Why the two? That's a little complicated, but there's part of this velocity that we don't see on the earth because just given the position that we're in, even if we don't see anything moving, we're moving at a rate which is omega, the, velo the angular velocity times our displacement. Add that to the other one and you get two omega V. Let's not worry about the two. The point is there has to be a force perpendicular to the velocity. Now, we're aware of this when we look at weather maps. So on a weather map, let's draw the isobars. Here are the isobars. Those are lines of constant pressure. Here's the, say the high pressure is on this side and the low pressure is on that side. So the force will be from the high pressure to the low pressure. Oops. And what happens is the flow goes perpendicular to that along the isobars, not across the isobars. Now try it in your, in your living room right now. Okay, produce a pressure. Which way is the air moving? It's moving from high pressure to low pressure. But if you're on a large scale and things are happening over a period of time, 
of several days so that you sense the rotation of the earth, then instead of the motion going in the direction of the pressure difference, it goes at right angles to it. Now, the part of the velocity that we're interested in, the major part is the velocity that's tangent to the Earth's surface, because the vertical velocity is very, very tiny. And the rotation, the part of the rotation that can twist that velocity, rotate that velocity, is the component of the rotation that's perpendicular to the Earth's surface, and that's omega times the sine of the angle. A little bit of math there, that's a little trigonometry. So that the force depends on omega and the sine of the latitude. So let's see what this will do for the ocean. See what, how much we can understand what's happening. So suppose we look down on the ocean and suppose we have a wind stress on the ocean going from west to east like this, okay? And what we said was that the motion would be at right angles to that. And that would produce a motion this way at right angles to the south, oops. Oops. And that motion is limited to the upper 100 meters of the ocean. Let's look at it from the side. So here we're looking from the west, we're looking to the east. And in our latitude, the winds are blowing west to east. If we go closer to the equator, the winds are blowing east to west in the opposite direction. So according to this picture here, the force would be into the paper, into the board. The fluid would be flowing this way in that upper 100 meters. This way, the fluid would be flowing that way. When they get together, when they get close, there has to be a flow downward to preserve the mass. And that vertical velocity that's produced is extremely tiny. One ten thousandth of a centimeter a second. And that is enough to drive the whole ocean circulation that we were just looking at. And in fact, there is an example of that effect that's very, very evident if you happen to be in Oregon, the coast of Oregon in the summertime, in the summertime, the wind generally blows from the north on the water. Using the reasoning that we just had, due to the Earth's rotation, that will produce a force. I mean, that force will produce a motion of the water, the upper water offshore. And that motion offshore of the surface water has to be replaced, and that will produce an upwelling of deep water along the Oregon coast in the summer. That upwelled water is full of nutrients. The salmon love it. And that's why in the summertime, if you want to go salmon fishing, I would suggest you go to the Oregon coast. And um, that's where most of our salmon comes from. And it's a, a perfect example of this factor that the stress is this way, the horizontal motion of the water is at right angles to it, and it has to be replaced by some upwelling. I wanna talk about the spin of the ocean. Every fluid element has a ro elemental rotation. It's twice its angular velocity. Part of it, it's due to its own velocity relative to the Earth. But over most of the Earth, the ocean, the effective spin of the, of the, the Earth dominates so that the spin is what each fluid element feels. And that's twice the Earth's rotation times the sine of the angle. Now think about a column of fluid. Here's this column of fluid. Remember, we were pressing down on it with that little bit of water that's moving vertically. And so it expands horizontally. As it expands horizontally, just like a skater moving her arms out, the spin has to be smaller, slower. 
Well, slower spin, when the spin is the Earth's rotation to omega sine theta, means that the fluid has to move to a place where sine theta is slower. That's at lower latitudes. And so the, the effect of the winds producing that vertical velocity drives that water southward over most of the ocean. Now, if that were just to continue just by itself, we would drain the ocean. So there has to be a place for the water to come back. Well, where does it come back? What well, has to come back, not in the middle of the ocean because the dynamics in the middle of the ocean were sending it southward. So it can either come back on the eastern or the, on the uh, western side of the ocean or on the eastern side of the ocean. If it comes back on the western side, think of this little column of fluid as it moves northward here and there's friction against this wall, it will start to rotate in this clockwise fashion and pick up more rotation. And then it will allow it to come back and join the circulation again. And that's the, that's the fundamental reason why we have this asymmetry between the western side of the ocean and the eastern side of the ocean. That's why the Gulf Stream is on the western side of the ocean. Now to really prove all that and show that to you, I have to do a lot more mathematics, but it's the basic, the basic story is what I've told there. But let's take a look at another feature of the ocean. What I'm showing here in these diagrams is the temperature field from the South Pole to the North Pole. In the upper figure is the temperature field of the first thousand meters for, from the surface below. The, the second picture is the, uh, the, the, whole, the whole depth. This is a kind of an average uh, for the uh, water. And the warm water is in the, the very red and the medium temperature water is pink and the cold water is blue. Notice something interesting. In mid-latitudes where we are, say in the Northern hemisphere here, the warm water is fairly deep, a thousand meters, 2000 meters. And as we go northward, that thickness, that layer of very warm water gets smaller and smaller until it finally disappears. That makes sense because it's got pretty cold up here. So you don't expect to find warm water there. But look what happens as we get closer to the equator. The warm water gets very shallow there too. You'd expect the warm water at the equator in tropical regions to be the deepest because of all of the heating. But that's not what you see. You see, in fact, the warm water is very thin at the equator. Now, why is that? The, the problem or the structure that we're trying to explain and why we're puzzling over here is called the problem of the thermocline, explaining the thermal structure of the ocean. And explaining that structure is kind of a first order problem in understanding the ocean. How do we explain it? Well, we have to go back. I hope you get used to this now. We have to go back to spin. So here is the picture again. Here are the lines of density, the same, almost the same as the temperature. Here in the Northern hemisphere, you see the, the, the how they get shallow as you get close to the, oops, how you get close to the equator. Shallow as you go north, deepest in mid-latitudes, same in the southern hemisphere. They also get deeper as you go westward from the, um, say, the eastern side of the Atlantic, the western side, the, those surfaces get deeper. But why does it become shallow at the equator? Again, it's the spin that's going to determine this. They're going to tell us this. And to deal with layers of uh, various thicknesses 
the measure of the spin in the, in the mid-ocean is called the potential vorticity. Now the potential vorticity, potential vorticity, I think would be a great name for a racehorse. I mean, I can just imagine coming up on the outside is potential vorticity, neck and neck, neck and neck with Coriolis, who is going to win? So what it really is, is you take the total spin. This is the part due to the Earth's rotation and it depends on the latitude. Here is a part that depends on the spin that we actually see ourselves of the spinning water, like you would see when the water goes down your drain. And we call it potential vorticity because we divide it by the layer thickness. So if this is conserved, the potential vorticity is conserved, as H, as, as, as the vorticity increases, the depth, the thickness of the layer has to increase. If it decreases, the thickness has to decrease. So normally we can ignore this term in the mid ocean. And when a fluid column expands laterally, its spin decreases. And so the layer thickness contracts. So there's a tendency for Q to be conserved. So now we talked about the flow going southward being driven by the wind as it goes southward closer to the equator where sine theta goes to zero, the thickness to preserve potential vorticity has to decrease. And that simple argument is the reason for the, for the behavior that we just saw. Now here is a, a calculation from a very simple model. So here are two layers of fluid, oops, two layers of fluid that we're driving. So here's north, here's the North Pole, here's the equator, here's the upper layer, here's the thickness of the lower layer. The lower layer only, uh, 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 well, I'm showing it all the way here, but the upper layer only starts here. The lower layer uh, circulates all the way down here, but you can see that the calculation using mathematics, the calculation, just preserving potential vorticity in that argument that we had produces, reproduces the structure that we saw in the measurements of this thinning of the, th the warm water layer uh, as we get to the equator. More mysteries, more mysteries. In the Atlantic, in the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean, there are current, there is a current that flows along the equator like an arrow directly west to east. It's as rapid as the Gulf Stream. It's as about a, flowing about a meter per second at its fastest. It's about as broad as the Gulf Stream. It's 100 kilometers in width. And it's flowing in a direction under the surface against the wind. And this, this current was actually discovered accidentally in the 19th century on the child, uh, by an English oceanographic expedition, the Challenger expedition. And embarrassing to say, people forgot about it. And then it was rediscovered in the 1950s. And there was a big rush to try to explain the existence of this current. So here in this figure is a cross section contouring of the velocities. Here is the max, here is a function of latitude and depth. Here we are at the equator. So here's the maximum velocity here. And then as you go out, the velocity decreases. And here it is at uh, a little further east. It's a shallower. In fact, if you look at the profile of the velocity, as a function of uh, the, the eastward velocity as a function of depth, uh, you can see that it's a little bit westward at the surface, but then down below, you have this strong velocity pointing eastward. And again, that's against the direction of flow of the wind. Why? 
again, it's our, our good racehorse potential vorticity that run, rides to the rescue. So when we get near the equator, the usually dominant term in the potential vorticity that has to do with the Earth's rotation that's perpendicular to the surface becomes small at the equator because the perpendicular component of the rotation to the Earth, Earth's rotation is, goes to zero as the latitude goes to zero. So this other term, the, the vorticity, the spin and the currents themselves becomes competitive. It makes the theory very, very difficult. Makes the theory, but, it, but we know the relationship of the potential vorticity to these streamlines because that was set further north where the flow was in that thermocline region. And the flow goes southward as we saw in the thermocline, in the gyre. And then look what happens when we get closer to the equator. If the flow is going southward, which way does the pressure force have to be to make the flow go this way? The pressure force has to be at right angles this way. So the pressure force is from west to east. Pressure force acting on this fluid is where the rotation is still important that drives the fluid southward. But when you get to the equator, this term is zero. There is no Coriolis force, but you still have that pressure force. And it's that pressure force that pushes the flow west to east. And that's the complete explanation for that equatorial undercurrent. And, and the theory gives this velocity structure showing that westward velocity at mid latitudes and then a strong eastward velocity as you get close to the equator. I mean, it's wonderful for those of us who are trying to understand this, to think about how all these currents are connected together. And the simplest physical explanation explains behavior that seems odd, to say the least. Let's look at the water beneath the warm water we were talking about. This water is very cold. It's close to freezing. Of course, the freezing point of salt water is not the freezing point of fresh water, but it's still close to zero degrees. And here is this cold water at great depth, even at the equator, even at the equator. And so the only place that cold water is made like this is at the poles. And so that implies that there has to be a deep circulation of cold water from the poles to fill the deep basins with cold water. And then how they circulate and come back is another question. But the fact that there has to be this overturning circulation was recognized by uh, someone uh, in the uh, 18th century, uh, early 19th century, I would say kindly that he was a, a rascal, uh, Count Rumford, Benjamin Thompson. Uh, he was an American who, um, for various reasons, uh, was a Tory and went over to the British. But he recognized a lot of interesting physical uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, he noticed when people were boring holes in cannons to make the, the, the muzzle of a cannon, that the cannon heated up. And he got the idea that energy was conserved, that the energy that went into the friction of boring the, the hole in the cannon turned into heat. And that was the kind of the first ideas about thermodynamics and conservation of energy. And he was the one that realized that there had to be this overall circulation. He had to leave the United States he went to Austria. The emperor of Austria uh, made him a count. And um, he ended up marrying uh, the chemist Lavoisier's, chemist Lavoisier, you may recognize the, the man, I think the man who discovered oxygen um, was, uh, and who was guillotined 
in um, during the French Revolution, another scientist who uh, uh, was not politically uh, comfortable for people, uh, Rumford married her, uh, his widow. Anyway, this circulation is extraordinarily important for our climate. And Wally Broker, a uh, wonderful oceanographer, uh, put together a picture, this is highly schemat uh, schematic, of this circulation. So what you have is, is a warm water flow, for example, in the Atlantic going northward, sinking, flowing southward under the Gulf Stream, going into Antarctica, going into the Pacific, whoops, I keep doing that, keep into the Pacific and coming around, coming upwelling in the Pacific, coming around through the Malacca Straits, through the Indian Ocean, back to the Atlantic, the same thing's happening in the Indian Ocean. And this enormous conveyor belt that they talk about, that may take thousand years for a fluid element to make the whole circuit is the crucial component in climate in, in um, uh, providing a heat transport from low to high latitudes. And the Gulf Stream is part of that. And here is another, another uh, uh, schematic of that. The red is the upper currents, the dark are the lower currents, and this is a, focusing on the Atlantic Ocean. A more complete picture gives a very complicated picture, but, it, but it's a three-dimensional circulation uh, involving those gyres that, and involving a complete circulation around Antarctica, because that's the only place where the water can go all the way around. And I would say a, a adequate theory for this circulation now, I would say in my own mind is lacking. Uh, while the circulation of the wind driven part in the upper ocean is, is uh, clearly wind driven, the deep circulation is a puzzle. Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, who was the postmaster general of the colonies before the revolution, uh, was concerned that mail from England it took a very long time to get to the United States. And so he asked some fishermen about this. And they said, well, you know, uh, we see the packet boats coming here and we tell them that they're fighting against a stream. And, uh, uh, but they won't listen to us because we're just simple fishermen. So Franklin, made a map of his picture of the Gulf Stream and so that the packet boats could avoid that circulation. So here is where he thought they ought to be doing. And this picture that Franklin has engraved, this, what, this is his original picture, and, and the picture we've been talking about so far is all of a circulation that's fairly steady, that keeps its shape, its structure. However, this is not really what the Gulf Stream looks like in reality. If you look from space, what you see is a beautiful pattern of eddies. The Gulf Stream meanders, sheds eddies. It's very time dependent. It's very much like, and here's another picture of it in the infrared of the meandering stream. Here is a picture of the meandering of the Kurashio current in the Pacific. It's like a weather pattern. And that's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. It's the same thing that gives rise to weather. And did you ever ask yourself a question? Why is there weather? We you know why the tides, the moon pulls the water and it pulls it periodically. And in fact, you can buy a tidal table that will tell you what the tides will be six months from now, but the weather, 
not six months from now, all right? Where does the weather come from? Where do those waves come from? Well, because of the Earth's rotation, the density surfaces and the temperature surfaces are sloping in the ocean and in the atmosphere. And the slope depends on the Earth's rotation and it depends on the change in the velocity vertically. So in the Gulf Stream, for example, where you have strong velocities at the surface and weaker velocities below, you have a very strong change in the density field. Let's see what happens if you have that. So here's the rotation. Here are the surfaces of constant depth. And now the density surfaces are going to be tilted because of the rotation. And so now take a look at this. If you have a piece of fluid here and you raise it this way, it's going to go from colder water to warmer water. And that piece of cold water will just come right back down again. Oops. On the other hand, if you take a piece of water here, okay, remember this water is warmer than this water, which is the same as this water. So if I displace this particle in this angle between the level surface and the tilt of the temperature surfaces, that warm water will now be surrounded by cold water and be lighter than that cold water and will keep on moving. And that's the fundamental, that's the fundamental manifestation, the fundamental mechanism for this instability that produces the meanders in the ocean and produces weather waves in the atmosphere. And this was first shown by Jewel Charney in 1947. And it wasn't until the 60s and 70s that the oceanographers caught on that the same thing was happening in the ocean. The oceanographers were very surprised. The meteorologists were surprised that the oceanographers were so surprised. I don't, I don't want to spend any more time uh, on this. The observing the ocean uh, has been revolutionized in recent years by autonomous floats that descend in the ocean, telemeter back information. And there are at the present time, 4,000 of them in the ocean, giving us that information. Instead of having just a few ships trying to take data all over, we have these, uh, these uh, autonomous floats giving us this information. So that's our home. That was a quick tour of those seven rooms that we can't breathe in. And we're just beginning to understand their physics, the chemistry and the biology. And it's important to understand their role in maintaining our home's livability. The ocean is big and it's fragile in many ways. And it's very beautiful. And its inner workings are fascinating. And I have to say it has been a privilege my privilege to be able to have spent my life trying to understand how that works. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Pedlowski. Really appreciate it. My name's Amanda Tremont. I work in the Office of Alumni Engagement and I'm so happy to be here today. Um, Professor, if you wouldn't mind, just pull, stop sharing your screen. We can jump right into the Q&A. Okay, so how do I stop oh, st stop sharing? Okay. Yep, okay. There we, are. There we go. By the way, that's, right. that's, that's Woods Hole behind me. I was gonna ask if that, where that was taken. It's a beautiful photo. Okay. So we are going to jump right into the Q&A. We had a lot of pre-submitted questions, so we're going to go ahead and start with those. So let me just open up my email. Okay. The first question that we have is, what do you think the impact of ocean rise will be on Cape Cod? It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. 
Um, I mean, uh, there's, two. there's really, there can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's going to be, uh, not immediately, but there's going to be real problems with sea level rise. Part of the sea level rise that we're experiencing now is just due to the warming of the ocean. Nothing to do with melting glaciers. As water warms, it expands. And it's the ocean that's been taking up most of the heat. We worry about the heat going in the atmosphere, but most of the heat that's been generated, extra heat has been trapped into the ocean. The ocean's getting warmer. And as that happens, the water expands and sea level is rising for that reason. At the same time, if there are glaciers in Greenland and Antarctica that are on land now that slide into the ocean and melt, sea level will rise even further. Uh, I would say if you have beachfront property on um, Cape Cod, uh, you have either a choice of building a good seawall or finding a good real estate agent. And at what point do you see this as being problematic? And are we talking, you know, like five years, 10 years further down the line? What are your thoughts on that? I worry about my grandchildren. Okay, our next question is, I'm a striper fisherman. Should I take into account these ocean flows to maximize my chance of catching stripers. <laughs> I'm not a fisherman. Uh, I, I have to uh, say something that always makes certain people laugh. Um, I have an allergy to fish. I'm an oceanographer, but I have an allergy to fish. And uh, so I never eat fish. Uh, but um, yes, the answer is that should be taken into account. Uh, I know uh, our, I was working at a I was at a workshop off uh, at at the at uh, Oregon State University one summer, and um, uh, we were flying uh, airplanes over the uh, coastal ocean, looking at the surface temperatures, and relaying that to the uh, fishermen because the surface temperatures give you a sense of whether or not the water has been upwelled, and that's where the salmon like to go. Um, so yeah, I don't know. What, I don't know enough about stripers to tell you the person that asked the question what to look for, but it should make a big difference. Are you allergic to shellfish too, or is it just no, fish? No, no, no. I can eat shellfish with pleasure. Oops. Can you explain how all of this? Um, affected La Nina and its impact on U.S. weather? Oh, El, El Nino. Yes, so El Nino is a, uh, El Nino and its other phase, La Nina, is a, uh, a, a kind of a joint instability pattern between the atmosphere and the ocean in the equatorial region. Uh, so when you have uh, the Usually the, the, um, the Western Pacific, you have convection. When that convection begins to move westward, you change the ocean flow that accelerates that process. And it just changes the whole temperature and, and uh, distribution along the equator and the wind field as well. And it takes about, about four years for that cycle to uh, go through. And that's related to the time it takes waves along the equator to go back and forth across the Pacific. Um, normally, if you have waves in the ocean, they spread out laterally in two directions, like throwing a stone in a pond. But for certain kinds of waves on these scales, the equator is a special place and it traps the waves so that they stay in a band or along the equator. And that keeps the energy from dispersing. And so, that, so those waves going back and forth, changing the surface temperature, 
communicate with the atmosphere, communicates to the ocean, it's wind stress as a response. And that is the basic phenomenon of the, uh, of the El Nino. Uh, and it was first explained by a good friend of mine uh, at Columbia University and his student, uh, Mark Kane, and, it, and, uh, and, um, and his student's name right now escapes me. Uh, but um, Zbiak. Thank you, thank you, Jack. And uh, uh, and that is, I think, another one of the really great contributions to understanding the Earth's climate, and it's the importance of the interaction of the atmosphere and the ocean. Could these ocean flows be tapped to recover sustainable energy without upsetting the overall climate? Oh yeah, I think I think there there has been a uh, an effort to do that. Um, it's the the energy density is so there's a tremendous amount of energy in the ocean. The energy density is relatively low. And it has made it hard to get a system of uh, uh, energy extraction from the, the ocean motion uh, that competes with, say, uh, getting it from the wind. Well, the deep, sorry, that's my three-year-old downstairs. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> Will the deep circulation slow down in the current global warming period? Probably. So it's the deep circulation is driven by two things. One, the, the uh, temperature difference between the equator and the pole, the fact that the, the pole is very cold, the water sinks, and then starts that big loop that we were talking about before. Uh, but also part of the circulation is driven by the wind and that will be less affected by that. But yes, it probably will slow down. Some people claim that it, they already see in the data that that has happened. I spend a fair amount of time in Hawaii. Why are the lucky, tides so much- lucky, lucky, lucky. Why are the tides so much smaller there than here on Cape Cod? I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that question about the tidal. Uh, it's in the middle of the ocean. I don't, um, I'm not sure what the answer is. Uh, I mean, the, the tides are big. You must think of the tide as a big wave that sweeps around the Pacific Ocean. And um, if you're near a point near the center of that sweep, uh, then the amplitude is not so great. And uh, it could be that, but I'm not really sure. I'm not a big expert on tides. Well, the deep circulation slowed down in the current global warming period. Oh, it, I think, yes, I think it is. I think it will slow down, uh, whether it will, as some people claim, whether it will completely shut off, that's, that's another question. But yes, it will slow down. Does the Southern Ocean Current that goes around Antarctica have constant potential vorticity? I don't think it has constant potential vorticity. I think it may, uh, and it's a question of whether or not each individual fluid element preserves its potential vorticity. Um, Okay, and I have one more on my email that came through. Let me just pull it up. What methods were used in the 1950s to discover currents such as the one you mentioned in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans? Oh, the, the equatorial undercurrent. Well, I think, um, I think it was essentially what they discovered in the 19th century. Long fishing lines out from the boat put a long line in the water and uh, remarkably, when they got to the equator, it got tugged to the east very, very rapidly, unexpectedly rapidly. So there had to be something going on there. Uh, that was really unexpected. And there was a big, uh, I, I remember uh, there was a, a, a big uh, 
discussion about you know what is this current what is causing this current and there was a uh, a, a, a wonderful seminar where four or five different theoretical oceanographers this is way back in the in the late 50s i think uh, each gave a 15 minute talk of presenting their theory of why of how this current arose um, and uh, there was one oceanographer whose job it was to give a five minute rebuttal to each of them. And uh, so the, the thing was really not settled, I think until more recently when there was a theory that linked the equatorial undercurrent flow to the rest of the thermocline flow so that it wasn't a, a isolated phenomena, but a phenomena that was part of the whole ocean circulation. That was a much, I think much more convincing uh, argument. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Professor Pedlowski. This was really great. Um, so much appreciate your time. Um, and thank you to all of those who tuned in. I am going to pass it back to our president, Mike Duffy, who is going to close out the program. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Professor Pedlowski, for that captivating presentation. And to our attendees, we appreciate your participation and we hope you will complete a brief two minute survey, which you will receive tomorrow. This event has already helped us raise $225 for the Cape Cod Tufts Club's scholarship fund. If you are so inclined, we hope you will consider making a gift to this fund. Amanda will post that link now so you can do so online. Finally, I would like to remind you that we still have a few tickets for the Cape Cod Symphony's holiday concert on Saturday, December 4th at 3 p.m. To order tickets, please use the online link in the chat box. Alternatively, you may contact our Vice President Len DiLorenzo, whose email address is also contained in the chat box. And also, I think Amanda is going to include those links in the survey that she will send out tomorrow. So have a wonderful rest of the evening and please stay safe and be well. Thank you. Good night.